Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Excuse me if you're watching on Zoom and I'm looking slightly uh, in a different direction. It's because I'm actually looking at the camera. We're recording this for YouTube and I don't want to be looking at two places at the same time. I prefer to look at the camera that's going to ultimately uh, have the video which is, which is filming the video which is going to be on YouTube. I'm going to begin with a fascinating article that I read many years ago in a publication uh, called Hamo'er. I don't know if any of you have seen Hamo'er. I'm not even sure if it's still published. Hamo'er was a rabbinic journal that thrived for many, many years after the Second World War. Its editor was Rabbi Meir Amsel. We're going to get back to him. Uh, Hamo'er uh, was had as its competition if you might say that, another very famous rabbinic journal called Hapardis. The uh, editor of Hapardis was a, a man called Rabbi Simcha Elberg, who was extremely active in the, uh, in the um, Agudas Harabonim of America and Canada, a close confidant of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Um, Hapardis was actually started, I believe, before the Second World War by a man called Rabbi Pardis uh, in Chicago. And I have a, a personal connection with him, obviously not, but you'll hear in a moment, because I went to a school called Pardis House, which was actually named after his brother, who was a rabbi in London. Rabbi Pardis eventually became very elderly, and before he passed away, he passed over the reins uh, to run Hapardis, this rabbinic journal, to Rabbi Simcha Elberg, who was a Holocaust survivor who never had children, um, and in fact, some years ago, I would say around 15 years ago, I was offered his library. There was a dealer in New York who had his entire library, or so he told me, of correspondence and publications. As it turned out, all the good things he had already sold, and he was selling me the remains, including Rabbi Elberg's passport, which I never bought. In any event, Rabbi Elberg's Hapardis, if you're going to make comparisons, was the Wall Street Journal of rabbinic journals. And Hamo'er was the New York Post, a sort of tabloid version of, uh, of a rabbinic journal. And we're going to see in a particular article that I'm going to read you now. Um, here's the, uh, the title of Hamo'er. It's the way it looked. It came out, I think, 400 issues under the editorship of Rabbi Meir Amsel. And this is an article I saw in the Tammuz 1969 Tafshin Chof Tess edition of Hamo'er, I've copied it, uh, and you'll see in a moment why. Bayomim halolu, he says, in these days, here ishu balei ho'itonoi sazula al ha-sensatsia shebishnei chiburim chadoshim shayfiu ze achshov. He says, there's been an absolute furore that has erupted as a result of two publications that were brought out in recent days and the Jewish media is full of this sensation. What is the sensation? Rabonim makim alibom al chet shechotu bekfirosom meoilom betzioinus vaachshav nifkechu einehem. Rabbis who are, as it were, beating their chests, admitting their grave sin and error of judgment with regard towards their attitude to Zionism, and as a result of which they wish to publish their recantation of their original view, which was very negative towards Zionism, political Zionism. And both of these rabbis have published books in which they express themselves vehemently in favor of Zionism and in favor of a state of Israel. So he presents this article. The author of the article, I'm going to read more of it in a moment, the author of the article was a man, uh, Harav Mem Abramson, Mem Abramson from Brooklyn, New York. Incidentally, I have a lot of friends in New York from the rabbinic fraternity who go back many years in New York. 
And many times, whenever I was in New York, you'll see why in a, in a minute, I would ask them, have you ever heard of Rabbi Abramson from Brooklyn? Never heard of him. Abramson, yeah, he was a writer. He wrote in Hamo'o, in, in the literary section of Hamo'o. Have you ever heard of him? Never heard of him. Abramson, Brooklyn? No, no such name. I mean, it would be one thing if people didn't know him if he came from Cleveland or from Phoenix. But it's surprising that all the people I knew from the rabbinic fraternity, rabbis who were involved in this kind of stuff, in reading and writing articles, had never heard of Rabbi Abram. So let me continue reading the article. These two publications, one isn't exactly like the other. Ha'echad Polani Vasheni Hungari. One of the authors is a Polish person, doesn't say rabbi, although earlier on he says rabbonim in quotations. Vasheni in the second one is Hungarian. Avalatzad Hashavesheb, the uniting factor, the commonality between them, Shechotu Beovar Venispakhu Beosid that somehow they sinned previously, but now they are admitting and confessing to their sins for the future. The ayateh ha-soifrim yordu an sochim halolu. And they wish to express themselves based on these previous errors with regard to Zionism, and they want to uh, um, publish their thoughts now that they have changed their opinion. Fascinating. Who are these two rabbis? Which publications is he referring to? Okay. So, I'm not going to read you the entire article, but he begins by saying that he knew or knows one of the authors very well. The two books he's talking about, one of them is Aim Habonim Semecha, Eim Abonim Semecha was written by Rabbi Yisrocha Shlomo Teichtel. Rabbi Yisrocha Shlomo Teichtel, here's an image of him. I'm sure that when we have the video, uh, the image will be flashed on your screen. Rabbi Yisrocha Shlomo Teichtel was a very unique individual. And he wrote a book called Eim Habonim Semecha. The book was published in Budapest in 1943. The book was written by this Rabbi Teichtel, who was a chosid of the Munkacher Rebbe. He'd been educated here and there, very much uh, lent towards the son's Hasidic dynasty, but like so many rabbis of the particular era, era the interwar era of Hungary, Slovakia, Czech, etc., he was very much influenced by the Minchas Lozar. Rabbi, uh, the rabbi of Munkach, Rabbi Chaim Eloza Shapira, and in fact, he was uh, so highly regarded by the Munkacherov, by the Munkacher Rebbe, that whenever there were very difficult Dine Torah cases that came before the Munkach based in, they would call him in to be the senior Dayan, particular when it was Chosha Mishbok cases. He was the Rav in a place called Pishtian. Pishtian was a, uh, um, a bath town, a place where people went for the hot baths, bathing, particularly if you had rheumatism. It was a resort town, and people came from all over the world, but particularly from Central Europe, and they would spend their vacation months in this place, but throughout the year, because if you had bad rheumatism, there was no uh, painkillers, there was no analgesics that could help you, but bathing in the waters of Pishtian could help, and he was the rov of this particular place, as a result of which, by the way, he came into contact with many hundreds of distinguished and very interesting people with whom he corresponded, and there's quite a bit of correspondence between him and all kinds of people. What is the significance of him being a chosid who was in the orbit of the Minchas Elozar of Munkach, is that he was a vehement anti-Zionist. In fact, in a book that was published in the early 1930s, uh, under the auspices of the Munkacher Rebbe, there is included in there a letter from Rabbi Socher Shlema Tachtel in which he excoriates Zionists and Zionism, 
secular Zionism is the scourge of Judaism and one cannot possibly subscribe to anything that they say, nor can one associate with anything that they do or with any organization that is involved with Zionism. By the way, that includes Agudas Yisrael. Why? Because the Aguda by that stage was already cooperating with the Jewish agency and was sending people to Israel. And by the way, one of the worst things that you could possibly do in the 1920s and 30s, even if you're not a Zionist, is move to Israel, move to Palestine, because you, by doing that, are supporting the Zionist movement. You are creating facts on the ground which will help them initiate a Jewish state. So Rabbi Yisrochah Shlomo Tachtor fell firmly into the camp of anti-Zionists in the 1930s. Fast forward to 1938. And as you know, in 1938, there was an agreement between uh, the Great Britain and France and Germany to allow Hitler to march into Czechoslovakia. As long as that, that was the uh, final step of his ambitions for ter territorial expansion. Well, you know that uh, uh, Rabbi Tachtel lived in Slovakia, which was part of Czechoslovakia. They weren't very happy. And eventually, at the beginning of the, of the Second World War, in the first months of the Second World War, the um, uh, Czechoslovakia was overrun by Nazis, and the persecution of the Jews quickly began. And uh, he, uh, he writes quite uh, dramatically about his own experiences. They hid in a particular place, and he could see people from his community being dragged away. And uh, for one reason or another, he eventually made his way to Budapest, where he was, I, I I'd say, I use the word in hiding um, with the most liberal sense of that expression, because I don't think he was hidden in an attic. I think that he could walk around on the streets, but he had to be extremely careful not to get caught by the authorities. He didn't have papers. He was an illegal immigrant, and if he was caught, they would expel him to the Ukraine, and that would mean certain death. Anyway, he lived in Budapest, and during that period of time, he wrote a book called Aim Habonim Samecha. Now, in recent years, uh, there have been two translations of Eim Habonim Samecha. I have both of them. It's unusual for me to buy two versions of the same book in English translation, but they're quite different. One, one of the translations uh, was put together by a man called Pesach Schindler. Um, I'm going to read you one piece from there. Um, so it says here that in Eim Habonim Samecha, I'm going to read you the paragraph by Schindler in his editor's introduction. Teichtel breaks with the prevailing theological position of his ultra-Orthodox contemporaries. Yet it was only three and a half years prior to the outbreak of World War II that Rabbi Teichtel's own vehement public opposition to settlement in Palestine was included in the ultra-Orthodox Tikkun Olam, which was published at the behest of Rabbi Chaim Eloza Shapira, the Rebbe of Munkach. Although the author clearly attributed his recantation to the cataclysmic events of the Holocaust, the documentation for his activist redemptive ideology was drawn from a massive cross-section of sources in classic Judaica. Hence, the author may have been struggling with his counter-ideology even prior to the Shoah. It is clear that Rabbi Teichtel was familiar with the writings of one of the forerunners of modern Zionism, especially the form which synthesizes piety and religious observance with settlement, with the duty to settle the Holy Land, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher. The rabbinic endorsements, the Haskamot, for Kalisher's important uh, Zionist work, Derishat Zion, Derishat Zion, Seeking Zion, published in 1862, were utilized by Teichtel as posthumous, albeit controversial, support by acknowledged rabbinic authorities for his own statement on religious Zionism. That is uh, Pesach Schindler's uh, contribution in his editor's preface, his introduction to his translation of Eima Bonim Samecha. I'm going to read you uh, some extracts from Eima Bonim Samecha in a moment. Then I'm going to go back to Rabbi Abramson's article in Hamor. Eima Bonim Samecha was nothing 
if not a complete and utter U-turn by Rabbi Teichsel with regard to what was going on in terms of the ultra-Orthodox attitude towards Israel. And clearly, there was a period between the two world wars where the Jewish communities of Europe felt that anti-Semitism, even though it existed, had been neutralized. Why? Because democracy had taken hold of most of the countries in which Jews lived, except, of course, for the Soviet Union. And if you lived in any country in Europe, you were free to operate your business, you were free to live your life, you had religious freedoms, you had social freedoms, you could get into a university. It was a meritocracy and it was a democracy. And therefore, the idea that Zionism would help Jews because it would enable those who were persecuted to make their way to Palestine, where there would be a state for all Jews, was, uh, was considered by ultra-Orthodox rabbis to be ludicrous and merely an attempt to undermine religion and religious authority, and therefore they advised all of their followers and adherents never to immigrate to Eretz Israel, never to leave the countries of their birth, of their residence and go to Eretz Israel. There's no necessity to whatever. Don't believe the lies of the Zionists. Now, in Budapest in 1943, I think that the view was somewhat different. And Rabbi Teichtel had a eureka moment. And he decided that he wanted to express himself. Man was a genius. He didn't have a library of books. And yet from memory, he quoted not one, not ten, but dozens of different sources that he recalled from all the books that he had read over many years in which the great rabbis of the modern Jewish era and even of ancient Jewish literature had encouraged people, if it was at all possible, to move to Eretz Yisrael and to take control of their destiny through being in the land of Israel and being in fact uh, in charge in the land of Israel, not allowing others to take charge of their affairs. I'm going to read you some extracts. By the way, the publication, Ema Bonim Samecha, which uh, came out in Budapest in 1943, who paid for it? One of the main sponsors was the father of my sister-in-law's father, whom, about whom I wrote an obituary a few weeks ago. Very sadly, he died of COVID. Willie Stern's father, Chaim Stern, who I mentioned in the obituary, was in fact one of the sponsors for the publication Aim Habonim Semecha in Budapest in 1943. As it turns out, his granddaughter, um, uh, um, the granddaughter of Rabbi Teichtel, married Chaim Stern's son, Alfred Avroham Stern, that was the older brother of Willie Stern, who just passed away, was married to a granddaughter of Rabbi Teichtel. Let me just read you some excerpts, if I may, from, a trans from the translation. So first of all, the, the edition mentioned by, uh, by Rabbi Abramson in the, uh, in the article in Hamor was published in 1967-8. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't have a copy of that edition in front of me, but it was published by a son of Rabbi Teichtel. His family survived. We're going to get to that. But uh, his son's name was Rabbi Chaim Menachem Teichtel. Of all things... Rabbi Chaim Menachem Teichtel became a Lubavitcher Chosid. In fact, uh, I don't know what the situation is now, but I do know that Rabbi Chaim Menachem's son, perhaps grandson, was the Shaliach in Berlin, Chabad Shaliach in Berlin, a direct descendant of Rabbi Teichtel. Another child of Rabbi Teichtel who survived married a Belzer Chosid called Breuer in Jerusalem, and one of the dealers in London with whom I dealt with extensively was a man called Yusocha Schleimer Breuer. Guess who he was called after? After his grandfather, of course. Yusocha Schleimer Breuer, a Belzer Chosid, was a grandson of Rabbi Yusocha Schleimer Teichtel. In any event, this, these are the words of Rabbi Chaim Menachem Teichtel in his introduction to the edition from the late 1960s. My revered love, father's love, for the land, his fervent desire to expand its settlement with Torah Jews and his joy at its building were exhibited publicly at every possible opportunity. In other words, once he had this change of heart, says his son, he didn't hold it back. Wherever he went, he spoke about it. Alas, 
His fiery words in praise of our hallowed land were distorted more than once. Various groups misrepresented his views intentionally for various reasons. Thus, concerned for the honour of this pure and righteous man, the family was hesitant to issue this work for some time. So the reason why it took 25 years or more for Eim Habonim Smecho to be republished was because they didn't want Eim Habonim Smecho to be used as a political weapon by anyone. And they realized that their father's change of heart might be used as an attack weapon by those who were against either ultra-Orthodox Jews or against secular Zionists. Indeed, the author himself predicted this event very eventuality. He expressed his fears in one of his last letters to me. To my great dismay, he said, there are some who did not understand my intent in writing Eima Bonim Smecha. God is my witness that when I write about our brethren resettling in Eretz Yisrael, tears flow from my eyes uncontrollably because of God's people who suffer indescribable miseries. I see in the land of Israel a ray of light, an anchor of salvation. I know that there will be those who will attribute to me words which I never said and never thought. Still, he who knows all secrets can testify how fervently I prayed that my words not constitute a stumbling block. In other words, Rabbi Teichter wasn't saying that he was a sellout. He wasn't saying that he had betrayed his roots as a devout and religious Orthodox rabbi. What he was saying was that we, as Orthodox leaders in Europe, had made a grave error of judgment by discouraging those who looked to us for guidance and advice, discouraging them from moving to Eretz Yisrael and taking part in this incredibly important endeavor, resettling Eretz Yisrael. That, those are the words of Rabbi Teichter. Let me, let me read some more. So first of all, we have these approbations. He's got one from Rabbi Yeshua Kutner, and of course, Rabbi Yoho Greiditzer. This is all from the approbations at the beginning of Drishas Tzioin. Then he says, this is part of the author's preface. That means Rabbi Teichtel's introduction. He says as follows, My dear brothers, after presenting you the words of our brilliant and holy ancestors, you can clearly see that as early as 80 years ago, a Holy Spirit arose within our exalted and glorious anointed ones, the leaders of the generation, to return to our mother's bosom and no longer embrace the bosom of a foreigner. They urged us to devote our strength, our blood and our money to the Holy Land in order to raise it from the dust and establish it, perfect it and elevate the dignity of our King. It is well known from the Kabbalistic works that Eretz Yisrael is in the Sefira of Malchut, of kingship, the highest Sefira. The kingship is the mother of Israel. She awaits us and cries for us to return to her. I'm going to read you another extract. And this, by the way, is fascinating. Why did he call the book Eim Habonim Samecha? He called the book Eim Habonim Samecha because he knew of a story, he said, it's actually about him. I know of an incident in which a certain individual attempted to smuggle his young daughters over a border to save them from this horrible trap. They were caught in the jaws of the Nazis. It was the intermediary days of Pesach, Cholomoyed Pesach, and he promised his wife that he would send a telegraphed message from across the border informing her that he and his children had arrived safely. The mother sat at home anticipating and longing for the moment that she would receive the good news. But it happened, however, that before they crossed the border, the father and his daughters were seized and transported to a nearby village where they were placed in prison. There they remained for the duration of Pesach. They were in great danger of being sent off immediately to an unknown place, for that was the punishment for someone who was caught, a caught attempting to escape. He would be deported to an unknown destination in a harsher manner than the other deportees. 
In the meantime, his wife, the mother of the girls, was informed of the situation. We can imagine the bitter emotions which overcame her. Her joy at the prospect of deliverance was transformed into sorrow. Her holiday, Pesach, became a time of mourning for her husband and daughters. And the entire Yom Tov, she cried endlessly. Her entire world became dark. It is impossible to describe the sorrowful state in which, to, into which she fell from the time she became aware of her husband's and her daughter's fate, for she knew what awaited them. In any event, they were saved. I'm not going to read you that paragraph. They were saved by a man called Rabbi Ungar, Rabbi Shmuel David Ungar from the Nitri Yeshiva. But she didn't know anything about that. All she knew was that her husband was in grave danger. And even as he was being saved by Rabbi Ungar, she didn't know exactly what was happening. She heard something, and so she decided she was going to wait outside the house. Unable to restrain herself, she waited outside the house. And when they arrived, she burst into tears and overwhelmingly poured out all the emotions of her heart. On account of the profuse outpouring of emotions, she was unable even to utter words of thanks to Hashem. He who did not witness this reunion, the mother reunited with her daughters after such a dreadful captivity. The tears of the mother when she saw that her daughters had returned to their borders. The joy of the joyous mother of children has never witnessed true feelings of joy. This is what I know about this incident which trans transpired in our days. It was a story that happened to him. Aim habonim. Semecha, the mother of children rejoicing. Do you know why he called the Sefer that name? I imagine that such will be the joy of our mother, Eretz Yisrael, when we all return after the horrible captivity that we now experience. This is how I picture the wondrous joy that the mother will share with her children, that is, Eretz Yisrael with us and we with her. Hence, I entitled this work, Aim Habanim Semecha, A Joyous Mother of Children. May God grant me the merit that my book will impact the restoration of the children to their borders and to their mother. May we see the fulfillment of a joyous mother of children, a posuk in Tehillim, Kapitel Kufyud Gimel Posuk Tes, speedily in our days and may we go up to Zion joyously speedily in our days amen Kain Yehirat son these are the words of Rabbi Socha Shlomo Teichtel in the introduction in his introduction to Im Habonim Semecha the book that he published while he was in Budapest in 1943 now you're probably thinking to yourself what happened to Rabbi Teichtel. What was his fate? And the answer is, very sadly, that when the Germans marched into Hungary in 1944, he realized that his, the game was up and he snuck back across the border into Slovakia because he heard that things had calmed down there and as a result of that he went into hiding in Slovakia in January 1945 the Germans caught up with him and his family and they went on separate transports to Auschwitz January 1945 days before the liberation of Auschwitz his family made it to Auschwitz but they were only there for a few days and they all survived. He was on a separate transport. And in the same carriage, the train that was taking them to Auschwitz was also taking Ukrainian prisoners, anti-Semites. You can imagine if the Germans put these people into prison, that they were really scum, the worst kind of people that you can imagine. 
And Rabbi Teichtol and all those Jews who were with him in the carriage were together with these Ukrainian anti-Semites. And after a day or two, the Germans threw them a few crusts of bread. And his neighbor next to him in the carriage managed to grab a crust of bread. But before he could eat it, it was stolen by a Ukrainian man who was also in the carriage. The man said, no, no, that's mine. Please give it back. Rabbi Teichtol said, give the man his bread back. He's starving. And the Ukrainian laughed. And Rabbi Teichtol stood up. And he said, listen, we're all in this together. How dare you take away a man's bread? And they beat him to death. Days before the liberation of Auschwitz, Rabbi Teichtol was beaten to death. I want to read this article because, according to Rabbi Abramson, Guess what? Rabbi Abramson was together with Rabbi Teichtel in Budapest. And he says as follows, We were very often, we were involved in different matters together. And I attached myself to him and used to go with him to meetings to help him in his rescue, to try and gain some type of method by which he could escape from his terrible situation. He was part of the group that had been Hasidim of the Munkacher Rebbe, Kanoi Vosik, a zealot, a man who is anti Zionist, the Soyne Tsionis, the Tsionim Amke Nafshoi. This man was a, 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 an enemy of Zionism. Keshe Hischil Hagirush Beslovakia Borach La Budapest, and he goes through the story about how Rabbi Teichel ended up in Budapest. In any event, according to Rabbi Abram's son, Aim Habonim Smecha is a fake book. The reason it was written was because Rabbi Teichtel went to the Zionist authorities in Budapest and said to them, please arrange a certificate for me to go to Eretz Yisrael. And they said to him, why would we do that? You're an anti-Zionist. So he said, because I'm in grave danger, my life is in danger, surely you want to save Jews. And they said to him, you know what, you're very well known as an anti-Zionist. If you agree to write a book in which you recant your anti-Zionist position, we will arrange for you to get a certificate and you will be able to escape from Hungary and get to Eretz Yisrael. Well, Rabbi Tarchtel faithfully honoured his promise to the Zionist authorities of Budapest and went back, according to Rabbi Abramson, and wrote the book Eim Habonim Samecha as a result of their request, not because he believed in it, but because as far as he was concerned, he needed to do what he needed to do in order to escape from the Nazi threat. And in his own mind, and as he told Rabbi Abramson, he was going to later on say that the only reason he did it is because he, was being, he had been prevailed upon to do so by the Zionist authorities of Budapest, but actually those weren't his views at all. He published the book, he got money, sponsorship to get the book published, but in the event when the book was published, he never got his certificate, and he never managed to get out, and he had to run back to Slovakia and he was killed. Says Rabbi Abramson, to suggest, as the people who'd republished Eim Abonim Samecha had, that Rabbi Teichtol had had a change of heart and had become a Zionist, was utter nonsense. The man had remained a Kanai, a zealot against Zionism, and the book was a fabrication that had been extorted out of him by Zionist extortionists who wished to present, or at least embarrass, a anti-Zionist rabbi in such a way that they could pretend that the Zionist cause was now the cause of all Jews, including those who had opposed Zionism before the Holocaust. 
have to tell you, I, I read this and I found it very hard to believe, but the truth is, and I'm going to get back to that, as I'm going to get back to a number of things that I've already mentioned, but the fact is that this part of the article was only a platform. The platform to take down the author of the other publication authored by the Polak, the Polish rabbi, that Rabbi Abramson wished to tell you was, was in fact completely and utterly wrong, not like Rabbi Tachtel who had to do it because he'd been forced to do it, but this man had actually changed his views and was a fake rabbi. And the book in question was a book by a man called Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher. Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher, who died in the late or the early 1980s. Um, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher was a Polish rabbi. We have here some photos of him. That's him in later life. Uh, I'm very grateful as well to Menachem Butler because uh, there's been a piece uh, which I saw promoted on, on Twitter um, the Jewish History Soundbite is doing a piece on Rabbi Kasher and uh, Menachem Butler was very kind to post an article that was written by Chaim Lipschitz um, about Chaim Uri Lipschitz about uh, Rabbi Kasher in some point, at some point I, didn't, it, I haven't read the article, I printed it off to read it Rabbi Kasher was an exceptional Talmud Chochem and he in fact, he was born in Warsaw in Poland, in Warsaw and he studied under Rabbi Bornstein the Sochachov Rebbe, he was given smicha by Rabbi Meir Don Plotsky in 1915 and he went into Eretz Yisrael in 1925. Who sent him? The Gera Rebbe. Do you know who the Gera Rebbe was? Rabbi Ram Modcha Alter. The Gera Rebbe was an extraordinary man because he was a man who did see the writing on the wall. In the 1920s he went to Eretz Yisrael and sent others from his Hasidic group to Eretz Yisrael to establish a beachhead there for Gera Hasidim so that even if you were not part of the Zionist movement, you could live in Eretz Yisrael. And Rabbi Kasher was sent in 1925 and he opened up the Yeshiva Sfas Emes. Do you know that the Yeshiva Sfas Emes in Yerushalayim has been going for 95 years? The founding Rosh Yeshiva was Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher. In 1927, he handed over the reins to someone else and eventually, he, well, at that point, he started off something called Torah Shalema. I have the first volume of Torah Shalema, published, I think, in 1927. Torah Shalema took the project of the Torah Tamima to the next level. Torah Shalema is taking every posuk in the Torah and connecting it with any chazal that is related to that posuk. And then offering explanations and associations and... Uh, uh, um, elucidations of every kind of level from wherever you can imagine. The man was an incredible genius. A Boki Bukala Torah Kula. Menachem Mendel Kasha continued, I, I believe that almost 30 volumes, maybe more, had been published by the time he died in the early 1980s. He passed away in 1983. And Torah Shlema continues to be published. It's an incredible publication. Obviously, it's only for for, you know, if you want so many volumes in your shelf, it's an, it's an encyclopedic publication. And Rabbi Nachman Mendel Kasher had moved by this stage uh, later on in his life to New York, and he became involved in, in, uh, in literary work. He, for example, was the person who published all the Ksovim of the Rogachover. He found a huge cache, or was given a huge cache of letters, correspondence, and writings of the Rogachover Ilui, uh, the... Um, he, who was from Dvinsk, Rabbi Yosef Rosen, and uh, the Rogat Shover's publications all came out under his pen, and they were edited and put together by him. Incredible, another genius, perhaps be the subject of a future treasures, the Rogat Shover. I have a number of stories about him as well. But Rabbi Nachman Mendel Kasher eventually moved back to Eretz Yisrael after the Six Day War. As you know, there was a great antipathy towards those who had criticized Zionism because there was this fe feeling that there was, this was the beginning of the Messianic, Messianic era. Aschalta de Geula, the Six-Day War in which the Jewish state retook the holy sites of Judaism in Jerusalem and Hebron. And the Satmar Rebbe wrote a book, Vyal Moshe, and he republished it 
and ala ge'ula ala temura, in which he completely ridiculed claims of those from the religious camp who said that this was in any way a realization of the messianic redemptive era, even a beginning. In fact, if anything, it was something that was, uh, um, went against completely the messianic predictions of all the prophecies, and particularly the Chazals. And he wrote the book Vayal Moshe, it's two volumes, the later edition is two volumes. And as a result of that, Rabbi Kasher, who by this stage had become a devoted Zionist, at least a great supporter of the Jewish state project, wrote a book, I have it here, it's called Hatakufa Hagadoila, also part of my library. Bought it many years ago, Hatakufa Hagadoila. I'm sure it's no longer in print, in which he brings together not only contemporary evidence, but evidence from rabbis uh, going back generations and centuries to prove everything about the Jewish state being a theologically significant phenomenon. That is something which he felt was very important in the wake of those who criticized the victory of the Six-Day War. Now, Rabbi Abram's son took great exception to this, and he suggested, in fact, that whereas Rabbi Teichtel had had to do what he had to do because he wanted to save himself, actually, the sad truth is that Rabbi Kasher was doing something which flew in the face of Judaism. And he remonstrates with the conclusions of Hatkufa Gadoila and says that Rabbi Kasher is a fake person who only does things for money. In fact, you know, this, this is a book that was uh, dedicated in memory of somebody called Avram Yitzchak Zilberstein, Silverstein, a man, a New York philanthropist. His children, um, his children had dedicated him, uh, this book to him, Rabbi Yisrael and um, Rabbi Meir, had dedicated this book to him, and they had been convinced to do so by Rabbi Dr. Jung, of the Jewish Center in Manhattan, and Rabbi Abramson makes fun of Rabbi Jung and dismisses the children of this Silverstein, saying that they were, uh, were under the influence of Rabbi Jung, but that their father only supported Ger and would never have supported Rabbi Kasher if they would have, um, uh, the father would have known what a dreadful Zionist he was. I'm troubled. I was troubled and always troubled by this article by Rabbi Abramson. I could never find out who he was. But there was one very important detail in the story which I found absolutely fascinating. He said that he lived together or was together with Rabbi Teichtel in Budapest. And the Rabbi Teichtel had given him several copies of Ema Bonim Smecha that was published in Budapest in 1943 one of which was dedicated to the Gera Rebbe. Why would he have dedicated a book to the Gera Rebbe? Because he wanted help from anybody who could assist him in obtaining a certificate to get out of Hungary and get to Eretz Yisrael. And he knew, by that time, everybody knew that the Gera Rebbe had arrived in Eretz Yisrael in 1940 via Trieste and had managed to obtain freedom for himself and establish himself there. By the way, the Gera Rebbe died in 1948 in the midst of the War of Independence and was buried in the grounds of Svas Emes Yeshiva in Geula. And that was the Yeshiva that was founded by Rabbi Kasher as a connection. So interestingly enough, he says he never managed to get the copy with a handwritten dedication of Rabbi Teichtel to the Gera Rebbe. It's it's completely peripheral to the article because the article mainly focuses on Rabbi Kasher and only speaks about Rabbi Teichtel as the platform to criticize Rabbi Kasher. But he does mention that this, uh, this uh, Ema Bonim Smecha exists with a dedication to the Ger Rebbe. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that the person who published Hamor was a man called Rabbi 
um, Mayor Amsel. Rabbi Mayor Amsel is an interesting man. I have a picture of him here. I don't know if you can see it, but it will certainly be there on the video here for the Zoom. Um, Rabbi Mayor Amsel was an interesting man. I have some more pictures of him. Here's another picture of him. Um, there's a picture of him with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Here we can see for the zoom here. Picture of him with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Another picture of him much later in life. By Mayor Amsel. By Mayor Amsel, the publisher of Hamo'er, died in the year 2007 at the age of 100 years old. By the way, it wasn't his first Leviah. some point in the 1960s, he took sides with the Satmar Rebbe against the Kloisenburger Rebbe in the famous Machlokas between the, the Satmar Rebbe and the Kloisenburger when the Kloisenburger moved to Netanya and started with his project, his plan to build Laniada Hospital. And those who supported Kloisenburg were very angry with Rabbi Meir Amsel. He went off to a business meeting to stay overnight in Connecticut and they called a Jewish radio station and announced that Rabbi Meir Amsel had died and that his Levaya would be at 9 o'clock the following morning outside his shul in Bora Park on 18th Avenue. Well, he was quite a well-known personality and people were very upset to hear that he died and hundreds of people turned up for his Levaya at around the same time as he returned from Connecticut in a taxi. He got out of the taxi and he said, what are all you people doing here? And they were quite surprised to see him because they were there for his funeral. In any event, he lived much longer, almost 50 years longer. And he was eventually, he passed away in 2007. Now his son, Eli, um, is the proprietor of a, a Jewish auction website, Judaica auction website called Virtual Judaica. It has been probably for almost 20 years. And I was a regular buyer at that time on Virtual Judaica. And suddenly I see that he is selling a copy of Eim Habonim Samecha. And guess what? It has a Hakdosha, a dedication in it, to the Ger Rebbe. How interesting. He was selling off his father's library. And his father, his late father, had this copy of... The Eim Abonim Smecha with Hagdosha to the Ger Rebbe. Oh, I, I thought to myself, I must buy that. So I started bidding. The price mysteriously went up quite rapidly. But I did manage to get it. And here it is. This is a copy of the Eim Abonim Samecha published in Budapest in 1943. It's published. Here it is. You can see the brown paper. I had it rebound. And here is the Hakdosha to the Ger Rebbe. Can you see it there? This is the dedication written by Rabbi Teichtel to the Ger Rebbe. And I want to tell you the significance of Rabbi Teichtel writing and dedicating a book to the Ger Rebbe. The Ger Rebbe was considered even more dangerous to the anti-Zionist group, orthodox group in Europe, than Rabbi Cook. If there was one person who the Minchas Eloza hated more than Rav Cook, believe it or not, it was the Ger Rebbe. In fact, I have a book at home in which um, the Ger Rebbe writes that Harebi Hamunka Choi came to visit him to discuss trying to bring Aguda together with the Kanoim of Europe. Anyway, he made him wait a bit. He obviously didn't take him too seriously. He called him a Rebbe Hamunka Choi. He didn't call him a Admor Mimunka Mimunka Shlita. And the Munka Rebbe hated the Ger Rebbe because he not only believed in settling in Eretz Yisrael, he encouraged his Hasidim to live in Eretz Yisrael and he set up this beachhead of Hasidism in Eretz Yisrael and gave it his full imprimatur Gave it his full support. Imagine a dedicated chosid, a devout and devoted chosid of the Munkacher Rebbe, writing a dedication to the Ger Rebbe in his book, 
in which he promotes settling in Eretz Yisrael. That's quite something, isn't it? In any event, it gets even better than that. Because he didn't sign off on the dedication Yisocha Shlema Tachtel. He signed off and you'll, you'll see it on your screen, it will come up on your screen. I have to find it here. It says, Yesocha Shleimer ben Gittel. Do you know what that means? Yesocha Shleimer ben Gittel? It means he wasn't writing it as a dedication. He was writing it as a kvittel, like he was writing to a Rebbe. He had changed his allegiance from Munkach to Ger. He had changed his allegiance from those who were dedicated to the destruction of Zionism to a Rebbe who was willing to cooperate with Zionists in rebuilding Eretz Yisrael. What an incredible U-turn. Does that sound like the Rabbi Teichtel described by Rabbi Abramson in the article in Hamor from 1969? I don't think so. As it turns out, I have other evidence that this isn't true and that Rabbi Teichtel didn't just do it to satisfy a demand from the Zionists. I have a letter sent to me some years ago by a friend of mine. It's a copy of a letter written by Rabbi Nossen Tzvi Friedman. Rabbi Nossen Tzvi Friedman was the rabbi of Shikun Hay in Bnei Barak. He got himself into some trouble because he allowed um, the turning off of gas um, fires on Yom Tov. I'm not going to get into that discussion. He also suggested um, uh, he was a forerunner of those rabbis who suggested that one should say a bracha on Hallel on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. And therefore he was despised by various rabbis in Bnei Brak, as you can well imagine, particularly of Shmuel Vosner, but there were many others. In fact, they faked a Pashkevil against, against Rabbi Friedman. I don't have it. If anybody watching this has a copy of that Pashkevil, I'd love to see it. Rabbi Nossin Tzvi Friedman, the rabbi of Shikun He in Bnei Brak. He writes a letter as follows to Rabbi Kasher in 1969. He says, I lived in Budapest and I was an ultra-Orthodox young man davening in a shul called the Adas Yereim. It was the Haredi Haredi shul of Budapest. And Rabbi Teichtel was in Budapest and they invited him to speak. And he got up and he was a fantastic speaker. And guess what he said? Guys, we all made a mistake. And we need to move to Eretz Yisrael. Do whatever you can to get out of Hungary. The Nazis are going to kill you. And he uh, spoke and spoke. Eventually they dragged him away from the Bima. And they never let him speak there again. He was absolutely determined to deliver a message that changed the attitude of the ultra-Orthodox Jews of Budapest from the tremendously negative feelings towards Eretz Yisrael that had existed before the Second World War to a love and a yearning for Eretz Yisrael that he said was the only solution and the future, the present and the future for the Jewish nation. This was evidence from Rabbi Friedman, somebody who knew Rabbi Teichtel in Budapest, quite different than the evidence presented by Rabbi Abramson. But now that I had obtained a copy of the Ema Bonim Samecha from Virtual Judaica, I suddenly discovered who Rabbi Abramson was. Because as it turns out, Rabbi Mem Abramson is none other than Rabbi Meir Amsel. He was the editor of Hamoir and the author of articles that were controversial that he would write under the pseudonym Mem Abramson, Brooklyn, New York. And here, on the corner of the page, you can see his stamp in which it says Meir Amsel. And here as well, Hamoir. He was, by the way, his father was Avraham, Avraham Amsel, which is why he called himself Mem Abramson, Meir, the son of Avraham, 
Mayor Amsel. Mayor Amsel, who presented himself as a, a member of the Aguda, was actually a very strong Kanoi, but he couldn't present that openly. So therefore, when he wrote an article in which he excoriated somebody for being a pro-Zionist, he had to write that article under a pseudonym. And the man who edited Hamo'er was the man who wished to take Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher down and at the same time present Rabbi Socher Shlomo Teichtel as an unreconstructed anti-Zionist. But it's not true. Rabbi Socher Shlomo Teichtel did have a change of heart, as evidenced in the letter from Rabbi Friedman, as evidenced by the fact that he published a Sefer in which, if you read it, you can see that this was a heartfelt plea to Orthodox Jews. Move to the State of Israel, or the Land of Israel. Support the Land of Israel, and make sure that there will always be Orthodox representation of proper Judaism in the Land of Israel so that when the Zionist state is created as it was in 1948, only five years after this book appeared, it will have the strong influence of those who understand that the future of the Jewish nation lies in the land of Israel. And as so many rabbis, and by the way, you can see it in Hatkufa Gedoyle if you have it, hundreds and hundreds of Orthodox rabbis who had previously been quite negative or at least neutral towards Zionism, changed their opinions completely when the State of Israel was created and instructed their followers and adherents to vote in the first election. And of course it's been a roller coaster and there have been periods of time when there have been governments of Israel and officials of the State of Israel who have not been well disposed towards the Orthodox uh, viewpoint. And of course there have been occasions when the Orthodox communities in the State of Israel, the Land of Israel, have not behaved entirely correctly when it came to matters and comes to matters of the State and its survival. But nevertheless, we are all in this together. The Land of Israel, the State of Israel, the Messianic era, Moshiach is coming. Moshiach is on his way. And even as we are in the midst of this lockdown and social distancing, let us not live in a lie about what is happening theologically. We are in the midst of epoch-changing times. And this little vignette about Rabbi Socher Shlomo Teichtel's change of heart should resonate with us strongly and profoundly and affect that the, the way we look at things we don't necessarily have to stick to that which preceded us. And in the same way, as I mentioned in a previous talk, the Vilna Gaon banned Hasidim, and yet today Hasidim and Misnagdim are all in it together. So too, even though in previous generations there have been great rabbis who were very negative about settling in the land of Israel and cooperating with those who control Israel if they're not religious, we live in different times. And different times call for different measures. Hopefully you'll join me again for my next episode of Treasures. I'm delighted that you've joined me today. I just want to mention that this video has been, has been sponsored by Aaron and Lillian Fuchs. The details will come up on your screen and they should have come up on your screen also at the beginning of this talk. We're delighted um, that they have sponsored the video. They've done it in memory of Lillian's father and Jason, who is Aaron and Lillian's son, Jason's grandfather, Irving Glatter, Yitzchok ben Dovber, Zechroner Levrocha, his yard site was on the 29th of Nisan. His neshama should have an aliyah. We should all be zoicha to see Tachias Hamesim, Bimheira, V'yomenu Amen. <laughs>